So Jaleel Okafor, Nick Stauskas, and a second-round pick are going to the Brooklyn Nets, and Trevor Booker is coming back to the Philadelphia 76ers. And I mainly want to focus on Brooklyn for this, because I think that's where it's more interesting. But I will start with Philadelphia for just a little bit here. The question is if, if Trevor Booker can play with Joel Embiid, if he can play with Ben Simmons, if he can play with Dario Saric, because he's naturally a power forward. And Philadelphia already has a little bit of a log jam going on up front with Amir Johnson, Embiid, Saric, Simmons, as well as Rashawn Holmes. So it's up to Brett Brown to figure out how to work all that out. But I think Booker has a chance playing next to Embiid, definitely, because Embiid can space the floor at times or he can operate out of the mid-range, which he likes to do a lot. Booker is more about being around the basket for offensive rebounds, where he grabs about two a game while only playing a little over 20 minutes a game. So if you give him some more minutes, then he could be one of the better offensive rebounders in the league just off of uh, the counting numbers. And he can cut to the basket. He is actually pretty decent from floater range. He's overall a pretty crafty player who puts up like nine points a game. I think the only fear would be if you just had too many non-shooters out there. If you had TJ McConnell, Ben Simmons, and Trevor Booker, even if McConnell and Booker are pretty smart players, that might just be too much non-shooting on the floor to where it'd be a problem. But if Booker was just out there and he was the only non-shooter, or if he and Simmons were the only two, but Simmons is so good that he kind of makes up for it, then I think it could be okay with them. As for his one-year contract, uh, they must assume that they're probably not going to bring him and Amir Johnson back next season. So, yeah. And there's a chance that Booker could make less than his $8 million, uh, once he hits free agency. And I guess Philly is confident enough that they can re-sign him. And he's a veteran who's like 30 years old. So he probably has some decent time left in the NBA. So that is my attempt at rationalizing why Philadelphia gave up a second round pick in this move. Now if we can get to the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, young players. Young players and draft picks is basically what the Nets need to be doing given their situation, which was of course created by uh, Billy King and Mikhail Prokhorov not having any patience. And I think Sean Marks, I think he's just doing a damn good job with the Nets, man. And I think this is another example because Julia Logafor and Nick Stauskas have not been that good in the NBA. Stauskas' jumper has been better as he's gone along, but ultimately he has not been the lights-out shooter that you would have wanted, and Jaleel Okafor, I mean, take your pick. Lack of spacing, can't shoot, bad defender, not a good rebounder. I mean, everybody knows the situation with Jaleel Okafor, but here's the thing. Number one, if both of these two are a disaster and it just doesn't work, you still got a second round pick out of the move if you're Brooklyn. And if it does work out, well then great. You got a decent player out of this move that is pretty low risk. The other low risk part about it is neither one of these guys are going to be expensive. Uh, Stauskas is up for restricted free agency after this season. And I think, I don't entirely know Jaleel Okafor's contract situation. I don't know if he becomes restricted. I don't know if he becomes unrestricted. But regardless of what it is, I don't think anyone is going to throw that much money at Jaleel Okafor. You could probably keep him on your roster for like, at the absolute most, like $6 million a year. And probably less than that. So as a result, it doesn't really kill you if either one of these two suck. And while Trevor Booker may end up just being better than both of these guys, I mean, you were a bad team anyway. I think there was a chance that Brooklyn might have been going for the playoffs this season because they don't have their own pick, so you might as well just go for it. But then once Jeremy Lin got injured, the chances of that happening were basically thrown out the window. They're three and a half games out of the eighth seed right now, but the team that is in eighth place, the Wizards, have been without John Wall for a little bit, so you have to assume that they go up, and then you got teams like Miami and... The Knicks, who have been without Przingis for a little bit. All these teams hovering around the 8th seed that I would give a better chance to uh, making it than I would Brooklyn. So, I mean, why not, man? You got a second round pick and you got two low-risk young players. And if neither one of them work out, eh, it didn't really kill you anyway. 
Now, if we can talk about from a basketball perspective, do I think this could work out? Well, if we just start with Jaleel and spend the most time on him because he's kind of the the big draw of this whole thing. I mean, his defense is pretty bad. And there are certain lineups that he's probably never going to be able to play with unless his defense really takes a step up. And, I mean, if you compare him with D'Angelo Russell, I think Russell also has problems on defense. And those two together could just be too bad on the defensive side of the floor to where you can never really play them together. I guess the offensive potential with those two is something because, I mean, Okafor knows how to roll and Russell's been doing a decent job as the ball handler in pick and rolls this season. So you should definitely try it because you're going to be bad regardless. The Nets do have some personnel that could help out Okafor on defense. There's Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, there's Damari Carroll. Both of these guys can play the small ball four pretty well, or you could have them both out there. Although, Okafor with Hollis Jefferson, that could be a spacing nightmare. I don't know, Hollis, he's shown a decent ability of cutting to the basket, but Okafor has this problem where he's just on, like, he's at the rim almost all the time sometimes, and as a result, like, I don't care how good of a cutter you are, he just might ruin the spacing for you anyway. Which in turn means he's probably going to have to work on his mid-range jumper because you have to force opposing big guys to at least care about you from 15 feet out. Now I'm sure Kenny Atkinson can draw up some stuff to help out Julia Okafor because Atkinson's a good coach and that's what good coaches do. My gut feeling is that if Okafor can become a staple of this Nets team, it'll probably be off the bench. I think Jared Allen will end up being the starting center of these guys eventually because Allen... Seems to be a pretty damn good uh, defender and shot blocker. Or at least he shows the potential for it. And of course, that's the center you'd rather have starting, is the guy who's good on defense rather than the guy who's potentially good on offense but sucks on defense. So if we can hope for a little bit of improvement out of Okafor as well as some grooming by Kenny Atkinson, that could become something. If we can talk about Nick Stauskas. I mean, if the threes go in, then we're good. If the threes don't go in, then we're not good. Atkinson does have a spread floor. They run a lot of pick and rolls. So you could have lineups out there where it's like Damari Carroll, Alan Crabb, Nick Stauskas. A lot of shooters out there, which I guess fits into Stauskas because, of course, you know, three-point shooter, spread pick and roll, spot up on the wing. It's just a matter of if you can make him in, man. I think Atkinson will also run, you know, some more complex stuff where Stauskas is moving off of screens. I would like to see if they could do stuff with Stauskas and Joe Harris because they're kind of similar players. So if you could have, you know, the two white dudes who can knock down threes moving at the same time, force the defense to do a lot of scrambling, that could be some good stuff. Now for the end of this thing... I think I'm just going to big up Sean Marks in the Nets front office for a little bit because, I don't know, when I was seeing on Twitter, I think some people have the mentality that Billy King is still the general manager. Uh, I mean, Sean Marks has done a damn good job with this team, if we can just talk about what he's done. I mean, he hired Kenny Atkinson, who I like quite a bit. Uh, The Nets have been among the league leaders in three-pointers attempted the past couple of years. They're number two in the NBA right now. And, um, you know, a lot of pick and rolls, just playing the way you're supposed to play in today's NBA. Uh, Sean Marks, he traded Thad Young, got a first round pick, which became Karis Levert. He acquired a first round pick in the Damari Carroll trade. He drafted Jared Allen. He traded for D'Angelo Russell, which, okay, in that move, he did lose out on Kyle Kuzma. And Kuzma could end up being the best player out of that trade. But I wouldn't kill him for that because, number one, you still got the young player in Russell who you at least hope can be like an actual piece for you who can lead your offense. Which, given the situation that they were in where they had like no young players to really be excited about because they you know went so many years without draft picks... 
I think that's really good overall, you know? He also traded um, Boyan Bogdanovich and Chris McCullough to the Wizards, and he got their first-round pick, and that was the pick that actually became Jared Allen. So he's done a damn good job, man. He's hiring the right coach. He's getting young guys. He's getting draft picks. He's doing about as well as he can given the situation. So big ups to Sean Marks. And I'm not some Brooklyn Nets like apologist, but I just, it was like weird to me how some people still think the Nets like don't know what they're doing or something. I don't know. Anyway, I'm done.